to introduce myself um, and please, yes, in the chat, if you haven't found the chat button, please go and introduce yourself here to everybody. We are, you know, this is just the most wonderful way to meet people. Um, but me, myself, I'm uh, Dr. Ruth Knight. Uh, I work at QUT at the Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies. We are a research and teaching centre at, at QUT. Uh, nearly 20 years old, the centre has been going, uh, supporting the sector generally with research, um, but also teaching. So we run courses and we have a, a, a master's program for non-profit uh, non professionals and those in social enterprise as well. Uh, so one of the things that we love to do is just connect with people and find out how we can support the sector. And so Tea and Buns is something that I started over a year ago now because a lot of people were saying to me we just want to connect with you Ruth and we want to find out the research and we want to hear from some researchers and so I just thought you know what I'm just going to open up my office door once a month um, for an hour and let's all get together and talk about some really important issues anything that's going on at that particular time and so last year we ran tea and buns every month and we had some amazing speakers come. Uh, we talked about some incredible issues that were going on at that moment. So I try and sort of wait and see what's going on and what's going to be very valuable to people. Um, and of course, this month, it was pretty easy to guess what we should pick as a topic. Uh, we know that there's a lot of world, uh, uh, change happening in the world. Uh, there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, there's a lot of emotion just generally going on, but a lot of change, obviously, uh, based on that emotion. And so it didn't take me too long to figure out that we would probably talk about what's going on and how we're leading our teams and how we're supporting people through this time of change. And so um, just before I introduce uh, what we're actually going to talk about, uh, I just want to explain here, uh, so this is Tea and Buns, uh, just, to, just to let you know, Tea and Buns is not a webinar or presentation, it's a chat, it's a chat amongst friends and colleagues, so uh, please stay muted, but um, ask questions in the chat box, I've got my chat box here that I'm going to try and keep an eye on, Hello. as well as talking. Hello. Hi, mute yourself, please, while you're not talking, because that means, uh, you know, we can't hear background and there won't be interference in the background. Um, but if you do want to talk, uh, you can just say, can I chat? Or uh, there's a little place where you can put up your hand and I can see that you'd like to talk. So I'm not opposed to people having a chat. Um, or if you, as I said, if you just choose to put some comments or questions in the chat box, I'm going to try and keep an eye on it and, uh, and throw some questions to Cassie or you can throw questions at me as well um, that way as well. Great. I can see you all introducing yourselves on the chat and finding where the chat box is. So that's great. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, a personal chat between friends and colleagues. And so, obviously, this is you're, you're bringing your own experience and, and uh, your questions to this. But I'd like to introduce to you Cassandra Levin, Levin, who is a psychologist and a certified Dare to Lead facilitator working at QUT, um, has been working incredibly hard over the last few weeks because, as you realise, if from a university perspective. We have had massive change going on. Uh, we have had hundreds of staff and thousands of students have to adapt very rapidly to this changing environment. Um, and uh, Cassandra has been reading, uh, leading some leadership programs and supporting staff and students. And I felt that, uh, that it was for me to ask Cassie that whether she would come and speak with us today and, and so thankfully she said yes. And uh, so I totally appreciate your time today, Cassie, and uh, for really giving up a few moments of your time to really support us all and share your wisdom that you've gained over some years um, in this area of uh, emotions and vulnerability and daring to lead uh, courageously. 
So uh, we'll get to Cassie in a moment, but we thought it might be fun to just start off with a bit of an icebreaker. Um, because if you've looked at any work from Brené Brown, which we'll talk about shortly, Brené Brown's work, um, <coughs> she talks about permission slips. And she says that it's a really great way to start off meetings and a really great way to work with your team by just asking people, you know, what are you giving yourself permission to? And so we thought that we'd start off today by just asking what is your permission slips this morning? Uh, what do you give yourself permission to feel, to do, or maybe not to do? So have a quick think about that and we'll, if you feel, vulner if you feel vulnerable but courageous, let's put it in the chat box, okay? Because today is all about stepping out of your comfort zone, all right? And really being very real and authentic. So I was, I'll start off because Cassie, I, I was just thinking about, wow, what's my permission slips for this morning? And I came up with three actually. And the first one is um, that I give my per myself permission to ask you lots of questions and learn because I have about a zillion Million questions here for you and uh, to have you speaking with us and so I've just been jotting down all these questions that I hope you don't mind I'm going to throw at you this morning. Uh, the second one is that I give my myself permission to just be me, me and be authentically real. So uh, if I tear up or if I get anxious um, I hope that everybody is just going to uh, allow me to be me because I'm a very real person uh, like you all. So I'm going to try and be very authentic this morning. And the other thing I'm giving myself permission to do is, is have a laugh and, and just have fun as well. I think sometimes we feel that we get so, um, you know, we have to think about everything seriously. And of course, the, of course, we are thinking about things seriously. But I've been reading up about the power of laughter and the power of having fun in the midst of, you know, crisis and change. And so today um, I'm just going to have, uh, I'm going to give myself permission to have a bit of fun. Cassie, I don't know, have you got any permission slips for yourself? And I'm loving seeing everybody who's coming up with their permissions this morning. Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, so I literally bought post-it notes with me. So I've even, oh, because I've done my virtual background, you might not see very clearly. Um, but uh, it's, it is a very big practice of Brene to use permission slips, whether that be in meetings or in workshops, as an intention setter. So I, I am a, a feel feel Oh, and hang on. Oh, hang on. I'm getting some feedback. So yeah, might, I've just muted someone. someone. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, feel nervous, um, nervous and excited. So whilst I am fairly comfortable using the virtual world, I do it a little bit. Um, I normally have met people first. So normally I feel like I have a relationship and, and therefore I've got something to work with. Um, so I am a little bit nervous to talk with such a big group of people of whom I know almost no one. Um, but I'm also excited because I do love the work that I do. I do love Renee's work um, and I think there are so many different things that are in her, her current research that can really help us um, get through as best as we can in, in the current times. Um, from a to-do perspective, I wrote to take a pause. Um, I know when any virtual talking, any silence feels really, really uncomfortable, yeah. even more exemplified than when we're in the room together, but I'm, I'm giving myself permission to pause. Yes. And, and last thing I wrote is to not feel disappointed if I can't answer every question. Um, so I'm sure there'll, I hope there'll be lots of questions because that's how I prefer to operate myself. Um, and if I don't have the information on hand or if I can't quite think of what the specific answer might be, I, I very much commit to circling back. Um, and providing that information through Ruth and, and the network. Yeah, great. Thanks, Cassie. That's awesome. And, um, and I'm just reading some of these permissions that you're sharing with everybody. And thank you so much. This is the first step to being courageous. 
and to really think about, you know, what is it that we need to give our permission to do. Um, so some fantastic sort of thoughts there to kick us off. Um, but I know everybody's here to learn and to really pick your brain. So I think we'll kick off with a few of my questions. Oh, I'm not going to go to your slide. You tell me when you want me to go to your slide, okay? But we'll just, we'll just start off with a bit of conversation. Um, so my first question was really a kind of general question around, you know, how are people feeling right now? So you are a psychologist, so you've done a lot of uh, study into people's emotions and, and um, how people are feeling through the change and when they're being pushed out of their comfort zone, which is, you know, we're suddenly having to do things very differently and to be creative in what we have to do to run up, to keep running our organizations or to deliver our services. So I thought that maybe a great question to ask you to kick us off would be just, you know, what are what is normal right now? Is there a normal? It, what 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 should people be feeling right now? Yeah, lots different, varying, different one minute, one hour, one day to the next. Um, there's there's lots of emotions that we all. Um, should be feeling, but should isn't even the word that I, I personally like to use because it implies that it's wrong if you're not. Um, and I think that any emotion is perfectly okay at the moment. There's fear, there's overwhelm, there's anxiety, there's vulnerability. Um, and one of the ones which I, I saw that um, the Harvard Business Review over the last couple of days has released something, um, but when I was preparing, one thing that I wanted to, to particularly highlight is grief, yeah. the emotion of grief. Um, and the reason that I think that's, it's really important to draw attention to that emotion at the moment is because our, our research around grief helps us understand that there's almost three parts to it, that there's the feeling of, of longing, feeling lost, and the, um, and the sense that we no longer have what we used to have. Mm. Loss, longing and feeling lost. And people have lost jobs, income streams, yeah. freedom, access to toilet paper, access to those priority things. There is so much loss in, in so many different facets. Mm. Huge thing that we're experiencing across multiple areas of our life. There's the sense of longing, longing for the way that it used to be a month ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, whatever, whatever it even was. I can't yes. even remember it more normal. Um, but this sense of, oh, I, I long to just be able to go to the beach and not think about being distant. I long to be able to see my family and give them a hug and a kiss without worrying that I might be impacting their health and well-being. So this yeah. longing for a, a time that was or that will be where we don't have these concerns anymore. And then this feeling lost as well. It's really uncertain. Yeah. We don't know how it's going to be. The announcements are coming every day or two uh, or daily. Yeah, just exactly. we might be in and, and what that all looks like. So people, um, we're all feeling a lack of clarity and certainty. Um, so those three facets really help us and propel us into that grief cycle. Mm. So much research done around the grief cycle in that there's a fairly patterned approach of emotions that, that we go through. There's that initial shock and denial, um, i.e., well, it's happening in China, it's not going to happen here. Oh, well, it's happening in Brisbane, but it's not happening in the Sunshine Coast. Mm. Denial and or bargaining. Um, this, this ability to think that, well, it might be them, but it's not me. Oh, well, I might just go into work a few days a week and home and, and just trying to kind of work out those nuances. And then we've got the anger and the sadness, all before we get anywhere close to acceptance. And the thing with grief as well is that cycling process. We know that you don't just move through it nice and neatly and it's time yeah. to find and that you can just kind of potter your way through and, and day to day it, it, you move through, that we cycle back and forward. You might skip an emotion, you might go backwards, you might go forward, and all of that can be triggered by different things. So. Um, whilst we have those fear, overwhelm and anxiety, I think it's really important to also note for all of us that we have this grief and this cycle that we're going to be going through whilst there's still this sense of uncertainty and overwhelm. 
So, you know, the thing that uh, you're making me think of, yes, we're all going through this together, but we're also trying to go through it with everybody else. It's not like we're detached from this grief process. You know, so is there a is there a sense of responsibility? I mean, Helen has just said her son is going through it. I've got two kids, yes, and they're all go, also going through this. We've all got people around us, whether it's family, friends or colleagues that are going through this as well. Do you think that leaders or, t you know, colleagues are feeling a sense we distract, avoid, suppress, numb with whatever it might be, but we, we don't get that break. You jump on your newsfeed and you see all the different comments in your community, from your family, from your friends, from the government. Um, you come to work or you don't even come to work. Your your kids are there. It's it's certainly in my lifetime. It's the it's been the only instance where this impact is across all facets yeah. of our lives for everyone we know. Yeah. So what's, I mean, I was just reading in my news feed last night, uh, um, some friends of ours, they wrote on social media, we've both lost our jobs, uh, we've now been asked to move out of our home, um, and the, you know, the same dramatic, physically, like avoid, but acts um, to help people, and we number social media with ways that we actually get real comfort. Some people know that it's exercise, when you have, you can only walk by yourself, that, that's, that's difficult. As is um, the big pieces I think heard that I the time and feel so it so that they can be in that emotion for a little bit, but they can also work through that emotion. Yeah. What? Why are people turning so much to social media? Like it, it feels like my social media has just gone off. You know, it's just blown up. You know, in terms of how much people are talking, uh, what they're sharing. Why are we using social media as a tool to communicate? Um, and is this good for us? Because I'm not sure it's always good for us, but we're definitely using social media a lot at the moment. Yeah, I think personally, social media is good for connecting and sharing information, generally ideas and tips. But I think the limit that we have is that it's not about facts and evidence base and research and clear and direct information. So I think it's really important that we don't use social media to get the latest updates from the government about what we should or shouldn't be doing, but talking with your friends, sharing ideas about how we can um, cope with our children at home or how what little things that we can start to do, I think is an okay thing. Um, but ultimately doing that all day, every day is not good for us. It's never been good for us. And the technique to help us manage those emotions, but it's distraction. And prior to COVID land, it was probably the way many of us tried to avoid those uncomfortable emotions. We'd jump on social media and distract ourselves. Yeah. Potentially what we're doing is just the same thing we've always done, but there's no reprieve now. There's no distraction from that. So Whilst it wasn't really that effective before, it's really not effective now to help you feel better, to help you move through that emotion. Yeah, I think this is great um, information that we could be sharing with our staff and our volunteers, you know, when they're saying, oh, just jump, jump you know, talk on social media. We've, we've really got to be cautious and say and be mindful about what we're sharing and how we're getting involved in conversations on social media. I know personally I try to be very careful that I'm, I'm uplifting and I'm positive 99% of the time because I know that people are looking at what I'm saying and they're looking at what I'm sharing and I'm trying to put myself in their shoes and say, you know, how am I projecting my emotions and my fear or my happiness, you know, through a, a vehicle like social media. Yeah. So, and that's, that's that offloading sense. I have this emotion, I'm angry, I'm scared, I, I don't know what to do, I'm overwhelmed, I, I feel stuck and I don't know what to do with it. Like, and it's in me, so I'm just going to jump on social media and share it and then I feel like it's gone. Yeah, um, right. It's cool. not really gone. So, um, so I wanted to move on to kind of, you know, these, these feelings then of uh, fear, anxiety, uncertain. I mean, there's no two ways about it. We're all feeling that at some level. Um, so how are those emotions affecting our physical well-being and our mental well-being? Like, 
is there a connection between emotion <coughs> and actually what we do because we're all now working from home and we've got we've got to be self-motivated and we're not in that normal environment where we have our colleagues around us or we're out providing services as we would normally do how do we make sure that we're we understanding how emotions are affecting what we do and and how we're feeling uh, yeah what how we're feeling mentally absolutely and the the critical thing is that emotions are a physical and neurological experience as well as this this mind or sense that we have so we know in our bodies that we feel emotions almost initially at least at the conscious level in our body so the um, the knot in the stomach, the shaky hands, the sweaty palms, the um, shakiness. I know for me, particularly when um, I'm feeling quite overwhelmed and scared, it's, it's a lot in my chest. I, I sort of almost get around my shoulders. And that, that physical aspect is just one piece because our brain is doing a lot as well. And I know, um, I'm sure many people will have seen um, these types of models about the differences in our brains and that when we're experiencing different emotions, there are different parts of our brain that work well and there are different parts of our brain that shut down, that that frontal logical problem-solving decision-making piece will shut down when we feel that heightened fear and threat response. That's what evolution has given us. And when we're in a situation where there is real threat to our, our psychological and physical well-being, like the um, example you described of your friend where both people have lost their job, they're losing their home, that fundamental safety need that we all have is, is being threatened. So the fear and the, the uncertainty and overwhelm start to change what's going on in our brain. And if we are not able to get out of that, we feel that edginess continuously. We find it difficult to shut down. We find it difficult to sleep. It impacts so many factors. Yeah. Manage them, cope well with their emotions and have this mindfulness because um, if we find that we're just trying to manage the productivity or the, you know, where people are, we're trying to get micromanagement, uh, they're actually doing. Um, so I think this is very, very good, um, very good tips, I think, for me as a leader to think about, yeah, I just need to check in with people how they're feeling before I start saying, why didn't you do that report and why didn't you do this and I asked you to do that. Yeah, and ask more than how are you going because people, mind you, I've noticed, and in fact I've noticed it myself actually, is that you know how we always normally say good when someone asks how are you? It's yes. Us. I've noticed that the response has changed to all right or okay. So people have kind of tapered back the, um, their, their level of, of good, um, but it, people are often still unable to, to talk about what they feel and, and that value of language as well. Um, and there's a, there's a particular wheel of emotion and there's so many different emotion theories and how they all fit together. But one that I just find really practically useful, if you just Google wheel of emotions and just go to the images, what you'll see is a, is a circle and it's got tiered levels of emotions. So it has the anger, sad, uh, there's, oh, I am angry, but the reason I'm, what is the emotion? What am I experience? And where is that coming from? Before we even get to the, how do I manage that emotion? Um, thank you so much, because I think what you're noting and some people are putting up some tips of their own in terms of the tools that we can give people. This isn't asking us to turn into counsellors and psychologists overnight. Okay, we don't all need to uh, start, you know, yes, debriefing everybody every day. I think uh, what, you're, what you're saying is, you know, give people tools, uh, point people in the right direction. Um, we've got people just suggesting some apps and different ways that, uh, and, and, it, and it might be that not every tool works for everybody. Uh, people have to find what's right for them. But you as a leader or and as a colleague, uh, you, it's about sharing what's working for you, role modelling this, um, but also saying, look, this is, I found this really helpful or has anybody else got any tools or strategies that are really helpful to you right now? So another question I had, and as I said, these are people are making some great comments, but I'm not seeing any specific questions and you're very welcome to do that as well. Um, so I'm going to carry on with my questions. Um, 
and the next one um, was around that I've, I've spoken to quite a few leaders who are, you know, telling me that they're feeling very vulnerable because they want to reassure people. They want to be this, we're in this sector in particular, we're very solutions focused and we all want to calm everybody and we want to, you know, make sure everybody's feeling good and, but the, the reality is that we don't have all the answers. Nobody really seems to have any of the answers. And that is really making us all feel very vulnerable. Now, this is obviously the work that Brené Brown has been doing, some of this research around a time like this. Um, so I just wondered if you could tell me a little bit about what this research around vulnerability is and why we're all feeling very vulnerable at the moment. Yeah, and... Absolutely. Um, she's definitely catapulted herself into this world. And, and for those that have a little less awareness of her, she's um, Brené Brown is a, is a research professor from the University of Houston. Um, she also now has her own research organisation and it's vulnerability, shame, empathy and courage are her four facets that she's been researching um, over her lifetime, really. Um, and vulnerability has a really specific to the way that we use the word vulnerability day to day in our conversations. Um, I feel that when we use vulnerability day to day, we're typically saying that we're feeling a bit of weakness. We're feeling some big emotions, we're, we're feeling scared, but it, it's, this, it's this sense of weakness. I, I've got a weakness, I've got this that I'm feeling and, and that's vulnerable. I'm feeling vulnerable because I'm feeling weak. And that is not the definition that Brené provides us with. So um, ultimately, her definition of vulnerability looks at three specific facets. So it's, it's still an emotion. It's an emotion we experience, but in situations where there's risk, uncertainty, or emotional exposure. So those three facets, risk, uncertainty, emotional exposure. And clearly, in the time that we're in, we have all of those three things. There is great risk, great risk to our physical safety, to our psychological safety, to our jobs, all those different facets, lots of risk, lots of uncertainty, like we've already touched on, and the emotional exposure. When we're feeling big emotions and we're feeling like we're not able to, to manage them and they're creeping out, bleeding out, then there is that exposure as well. Um, so absolutely, these times are huge times where we're experiencing vulnerability, but that does not mean weakness. Um, the other piece which you were talking to there, um, so someone's just said, what were the four pillars? So four pillars of research for Brené, courage, empathy, vulnerability, and shame. They're the four. Um, so all things that really challenge us, aren't they? <laughs> absolutely. Um, but the empathy piece, and I, I've seen a few people mention it, is my golden tip for people at the at the moment, and again, Brene, and someone has already shared the website, there, there, she's got a bunch of different resources online, and they're really good resources as starting point. She's got little videos, there's an animation that I just love, and I bring into almost everything that I do, including my personal life, um, to help people understand what empathy is. Um, but empathy is that piece that we need to start with at the moment. So when we, we have these people, have our staff, our volunteers, our, our family and our friends experiencing these emotions, empathy isn't problem solving it, line it, um, try and make it feel better or reassure. Empathy is being with, in that emotion with people. And the challenge that we've got perspective is to be able to be mindful with it, i.e. I'm going to jump in that emotion with you, I'm going to be in that emotion with you, but I'm also not going to let it get into me. I'm going to be there with you, but I'm not going to get, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not going to get stuck in it either. Mm. And so these are specific attributes of empathy that um, Brene and, and others, Teresa Wiseman as well in particular, Brene connects her research to, have identified as, as the five attributes. So that identifying and communicating emotion, perspective taking, accepting that as their truth, no judgment, i.e. you're not good or bad by having this emotion, it's you just do, and then the mindfulness practice. So those five facets of empathy are the skills that are actually what we need to develop and practice, both as leaders and as colleagues and as family members. 
Now, you're going to share her model in a moment, actually, with us, but I don't want to skip over, I don't want to lose some of these questions. So can we just go back to a couple of questions that came through, and then we'll have a look at her model that you're going to share with us. Um, one of them was, how do we deal with members who get others to group up and continue doing tasks instead of following the distancing rules? So this is, uh, perhaps is talking a bit about resistance to change. Um, so an organisation maybe is trying to put in place strategy and people are ignoring. Is that your, is that your fight or flight again? Uh, the resistance to change is coming about because they don't want to accept the reality or this, you know, you've got to do this, 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 this uh, we're being told, this telling. Um, is, is that what's going on there? Yeah, it's, it could be for so many different reasons. Sometimes it's people don't have access to the information. I, I personally feel, mind you, we did get a text yesterday. There, there isn't an overly consistent approach to making sure that the basics are known. So if we go with a generous assumption of people, which I think is always a good place to be, they might not know in the first instance. They might be doing the best they can. And therefore, how does our mindset shift to help them learn? So is it about making sure that they've got the information that they, they need to have, first off? Secondly, if they do, what is it that's stopping them from actually engaging that? So being curious about it rather than aggressive um, and kind of finger pointing, but what's stopping you from keeping that social distance um, and understand what's going on for them? Um, and then work out where the gap is there. Uh, if it's to do with staff and leadership, we've got responsibility to set those expectations and we've got the ability to manage those as well, manage that person's not non-adherence. If it's someone in your community, volunteering-wise, and there isn't that extra level, then it is really about understanding what's stopping them. I have just written down, keep a generous assumption of people. I love that. And I think that is so important. I was talking to my uh, in my lecture last night actually about um, Mother Ter some Mother Teresa quotes around how it's you if you judge people you can't love them. Uh, that's one of her famous quotes and, and one of my favourites. And I think that's a, a, a very important point that if we start judging people, even though we they may or may not be doing the right thing, if we if we bring judgment, uh, we can't love them. So if we have this generous assumption of people, it's that it's making us curious rather than judging. And we can find out, yes, as you say, where the gaps of knowledge are or where the actual barriers are them for them if they're, they might want to be complying, but they just don't know how to, especially when they're so caring as well. I have that with my mother right now. <laughs> Such a caring person, but choosing to be caring sometimes over safety. And um, yeah, so I think we're, we're all facing that. Um, one more question from Denise. Any tips on how to stay productive and inspired to work when you're at home, cut off from your important social circles and dealing with personal anxieties during these uncertain times? Um, maybe this is a good question to take us into the model, do you think, Cassie? Yeah, the model's specific to leadership, so we can definitely... Okay. I think the... Some of the critical things are small chunks, are actually kind of scale back our expectations. When we do have this sense of overwhelm, our brains don't work in the same way. So we, and whilst there's that anxiety and that fog, we can't be as productive. So I think first of all, recognising that just because we're working from home doesn't equal that same productivity psychologically is really important. We have to actually reshape those expectations. What are, the, what are the goals that I have for today? What's the goal I have for this morning? What's important? How can I break up the routine? We know even just physically standing up every 30 minutes, moving around, getting outside, all of those different things are just really basic things that particularly right now we need to be practicing often throughout our day. Yeah, um, just one tip of my own. Uh, because I actually ran a consultancy for 10 years working from home. So I've had a long opportunity to learn how to work from home. And so some of my tips were always get up as if you were getting up to go out for work. So get up at seven o'clock, whatever your normal getting up time, have breakfast, have a shower, do your tea, you know, go to work. 
even though it's maybe in a different room. <laughs> um, so routine is really important. Don't always, I mean, it's okay once in a while, but don't always sit in your gym jams, you know, all day and forget to have a shower till the afternoon. You know, really make yourself feel, right, I'm ready for the day and I'm ready to work. Um, also, uh, I agree with your tip around goal setting. Uh, again, if you don't have people around you, uh, you have to encourage yourself. So by setting your day up, by actually making some t um, goal plan and say, what do I want to achieve today? And, and then working towards that is going to make you feel a lot more productive. And when you get tempted to go onto social media or you get tempted to go off and do something and chat with someone who you, you know, don't need to, um, then you can pull yourself back and say, hang on a minute, I'm not going to achieve my goal for today if I keep getting distracted. Um, so that's a couple of tips from me. Um, okay, let's see. How important is distinguishing what we are telling ourselves and what is actually true? Really crucial. Um, so I'll use that as our segue perhaps to go to the dare to lead model um, because it's that, um, that step is part of a resilience skill set that sits in the model. Um, but to, to go back a little bit to go forward, there to lead is the, the research that Brene released um, late in 2018. Um, and essentially it looked at all of her research so far, but took an extra lens about leadership. And she, um, she and her research group conducted some additional interviews with 150 executives across different industries, including not-for-profits as well. So really bringing about a broad focus. And the question that she asked to, to really draw this research together was, what is it that a leader needs to still be standing in the future? And the resounding answer that, that she got was that we need braver leaders and more courageous cultures. So saturated her data. Um, so then she's like, well, okay, what does that look like? What does that mean? And importantly, that's where these four skill sets. So if you do want to flick over, Ruth, um, yeah. to, the, to the next slide, people will be able to see it. Yeah. Um, so... Although she asked the people, okay, well, what does this look like? Generally, people couldn't answer the question. So she then had to understand, well, okay, what happens in the absence of um, brave leaders and courageous cultures? And it was through breaking down those barriers and therefore what people need to work through them that those four skill sets were identified. So those are in that triangle on the right. So rumbling with vulnerability, braving trust, living into our values and learning to rise uh, as the four skill sets. At the heart of the whole model, though, is this concept of, of courage and vulnerability being intimately intertwined. Um, so when we have the definition that Brene gives us around risk, uncertainty and emotional exposure for vulnerability, what we know when anyone who's seen her work will know that she asks this question of when have you ever seen some courageous, something courageous in others or in yourself and not had vulnerability attached to it? Yeah. Certainty wow. exposure. Because we, we feel that vulnerability is weakness. We feel that it, it's, it's almost um, means we're not good enough in ourselves. But when actually we think about courage, they go hand in hand. You don't have courage without vulnerability. And, and that's the pathway. So it's really critical to understand that in order to, to help us be able to get through what this vulnerability means, and her texts and roots are, are there with rumbling, um, but it's this lean in, lean into vulnerability, understand. And I saw someone earlier reference self-awareness. Absolutely. Emotional intelligence is at the crux of, of so many um, leadership models that are current, even pre-COVID, but so crucial for our current environment, I feel. Um, but it, it really requires us to understand, okay, well, first of all, I'm experiencing vulnerability. What is it underneath it, why might that be happening and how am I going to lean in and rumble, engage and move forward regardless. So as leaders, when we ask people to be courageous and brave, we're actually asking them to be vulnerable as well. This is like very important for people to realise, isn't it, that we, we the, 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 
the opposite side. Well, it's not opposite, as you're saying. You know, it's a good thing to be vulnerable. But we can't just ask people to be brave and say, come on, step up, you know, follow the policy, you know, stay at home, do this, do that all differently, when we're actually asking them to be very vulnerable at the same time. Absolutely. Renee's research tells us that it's not the fear that gets in the way around vulnerability, it's the armour, it's the response, the defensive mechanism that we have to try and be safe and get rid of this uncomfortable feeling. So it's about understanding how do these defensive armouring behaviours impact our ability to be courageous. And even at a really practical level, courage is being innovative. Because being innovative requires you to do something different. There's uncertainty, there's risk, there's emotional yeah. acceptance. Having difficult conversations, giving people feedback, problem solving, ethical decision making. Empathy requires courage as well. I, I, I'm going to go in this with you and I know I'm going to get back out and I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. So it's, it's really important that we also are quite practical in that, yes, we're talking about courage, but we're not talking about going and jumping off buildings. We're talking about empathy, trust problem solving, decision making, Eth ethics is such a huge piece around courage because that requires us to do what's right over what's easy, fast and fun. So understanding that actually those things are courage and vulnerability at the same time. So can you give any practical ways that leaders can role model this? Because again, this is about, you know, uh, you've said courage is contagious, but so if courage is contagious, vulnerability is also something we should be role modelling. You know, have you got any examples of how we could be doing that right now? Yeah, so <coughs> a simple example is about recognising that we need a learning or growth mindset is, is other work that, that people might be familiar with at the moment. It's not about being right, it's about getting it right. So it's... Yeah. The fact that we have to recognise that people are going to make mistakes, productivity is going to be low, and we acknowledge that and don't hold people down and, and kind of throw rocks at them if, if that's what happens. We have yeah. to give space for people to get things right over time. Yeah. Um, another example is around recognising and rewarding. We know that that's something that's really important for leadership generally, but critical around courage as well. So it's not about me getting those gold stars, it's about me giving those stars. How can we recognise and reward people that are, um, are really trying to be innovative, problem solving and creative, given that we've got less resources, it has to be all online. For this group of people, funding sources will, I am sure, be drying up left, right and centre. Um, so how, how do we continue to do what we need to do? We need problem solving for that. And um, Catherine has said, just can you elaborate on what does rumbling mean? What, why does she use the word rumbling? What does that imply? It is rumble because of just being from Texas, I think. <laughs> I, I guess if you replace it with lean in or engage, um, I think is the easiest way. Okay. Well, I guess the bit that is good is because it is about, it's a bit tumultuous. It's not neat, easy and pretty. Um, necessarily, but it's not meant to be aggressive. So it's not like tackle, take down, rumble. Yeah. Let's engage in this, let's toss and turn and roll it around and play with it, kind of lean in rumble. Not be afraid of it, maybe. Yeah. Uh, another quick question. Um, would you agree that when we show others that we believe in them, we are sharing courage? Is that a way, is that a practical thing to do? Absolutely. So trust is one of these skill sets of, of daring to lead and, and believing in people, giving people space and ownership and accountability is precisely demonstrating trust. So something that I think as a, another thing that um, people are able to think about is, well, how can I re-establish trust in our COVID environment? Because normally trust looks like I can actually see people, I can talk with them face to face, or I might do all of these different things. Um, so the, the model that sits in Dare to Lead Braving is actually an acronym. So each letter represents a particular element that people can build on to, um, to help them establish trust. And this is something that I'm talking with our leaders about at the moment is that we, we need to re-establish that. Just like when you change roles in an organisation, 
trust doesn't come with you, it's the very same thing. So we're changing environments, we're changing responsibilities, we're changing how we do things. So having a conversation about, well, if these are the seven elements of trust, what do we need to see from me? What do you need to see from me? And, and what would I like to see from you? I think trust also, from my perspective, comes when you see people being authentic. Uh, you know, when we are watching the news these days, we are looking for authenticity. We're looking for people in our leaders of the country right now who are telling us, you know, what we're doing and what's going on. We're looking for emotion. We're looking for compassion. We're looking for them to be struggling. I mean, it's because we we want to we want to trust that they are doing all they can to make the right decisions. And so I think from an organisational level, we have to be not, again, afraid of actually being authentic and saying, guys, you know, we are, as a senior leadership team or as a, you know, a leadership leader, you know, we're really trying to make the right decisions here and, uh, you know, we care about you. So that it's, don't be afraid to show that authenticity because that can build some trust. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. The um, the really one of the crucial pieces and myths almost of vulnerability is that um, vulnerability is venting, and that's what I would also caution people to um, to think about. Absolutely, if you think that sharing how you're feeling is going to connect with people, then it serves the purpose. But what I'm also um, what I advise people against is just sharing for the sake of sharing. Um, yeah. Because anxiety is contagious, just like courage. So if we're projecting anxiety, yes. projecting the fear without a sense of calm as well, then, then that's going to spread. Um, so I think it's about sharing when it serves the purpose to connect. But as leaders, we also have the responsibility to help create elements of control and certainty for our staff. Yes. It's about talking about how we feel potentially, but pairing that with what are we going to be doing? So it's not just left to sit there and, and fester. Absolutely. And in fact, one of the persons that I'm following right now um, who is the most calming influence in my life is a local GP. Uh, she happens to be a, a parent at of my kid's school. And so I know her, um, but she has the most calming voice when she shares on social she's using social media to share her uh you know messaging um but she's so calming and she's so um but she's not afraid of the truth and she's actually being very strong about what she thinks people should be doing um but my goodness to follow someone like her who you know is just a, a good reasoned voice in amongst all the anxiety and so pick pick the people that you know uh, can can be this calming influence, but but you can trust that they are giving good information. Now we're running out of time, Cassie. Uh, what was the other slide that you wanted to show us? Uh, can if you, we go to that one? Um, so we've been touching on some of the things about well, what can I actually do already? Um, so I've spoken to to empathy um, in particular and mindfulness, um, but self-compassion is a big piece as well. Um, so self-compassion has a few specific elements in there. Um, so it's about self-kindness um, in the first instance, um, and that is about talking to ourselves with a kind and compassionate. So not, I should be doing this. Why did you focus and get all the things done on your list today? How could you have done that? All that self-flagellation, negative self-talk that many of us have, have go on. It, it's about working out how to stop that. Um, it's also about common humanity um, is, is the second attribute, particularly connecting to Kristen Neff's work. And this is about that we're all in it together. Yes, there's spectrums of impact, but emotions are, are universal experiences. And so there can be compassion for all of us. So recognising that we're all in it together, the good and the bad. And, and that's why sharing how we're feeling can be really um, important. Um, curiosity we touched on. Um, so I, I'm a big advocate of a coaching approach. So asking questions rather than giving solutions um, is really important um, because when we're curious, what it's also doing is priming out <coughs> we're missing something. 
Um, so if by, by priming our brain to say, oh, actually, what mightn't I know in this situation? It, brings, it helps us be more open to learning and growing and helps with that connection too. So people don't feel that judgment and the threat like they would if we're telling them what to do. Um, within the Dare to Lead model, um, I think it's really about understanding that we're all going to be experiencing vulnerability and shame um, in particular in the current environment. And there's a specific um, worksheet that Brene has where you can go, okay, well, what are the, the armoured behaviours? So what are the things I'm doing to try and self-protect and how can I switch those to be more daring, courageous leadership behaviours? So there's 16 specific ones um, that people will be able to, to jump in and read more. Um, something we haven't touched on yet is around values. Um, so it's one of the skill sets of, of daring to lead. And the reason that is, is because values are a behaviour culture driver. And when there's darkness, there's uncertainty, there's a lack of clarity, values and having really clear operationalised behaviours, i.e. things that we actually can see people do or not do, is, is really important to help people make decisions in, in the current climate. So having those values and, and thinking about, well, how can I add some COVID-19 version of behaviours to those so that people have those guiding lights, those signposts to help them make decisions um, and, and really still feel connected as well. Um, and the last piece I've referenced there is around the seven elements of trust. So we were just talking about that model. Um, I know we don't have enough time and it's too hard to rattle through them um, and, and have anyone really remember, but, but those seven elements have a, a, a definition and thinking about, well, what boundaries, which is the B, can be put in place? What will be okay? What's not okay? How can I ensure accountability when things go wrong? Um, so having really specific conversations about trust and values are two, two things that I think are really crucial right now. So I think um, that one thing that I'm saying to a lot of people is that we're always faced with challenges. I mean, this is just a, an extraordinary one, but we, you know, in our daily lives, normally we face with challenges and we always have to think about what is the opportunity. And I think what we've discussed today is that we have a great opportunity to learn more about ourselves during these few months. Uh, we have a great opportunity to learn about our staff and our volunteers and our colleagues. Uh, this is a time for um, really connecting better with people and understanding them and showing more support and, and compassion and, and, as you say, daring to lead. And, and wouldn't it be amazing if we all came through this as better leaders, as better colleagues, as better service providers? Um, I just, I get excited, to be honest with you. Um, I, I know it's a terrible time, but I think that if we can harness this opportunity to become better people through this process, well, you know, that's, a, that's the silver lining for me in terms of saying how can we turn this difficult time into something that's going to be a legacy in terms of how we're going to do the new normal, which is being amazing, courageous leaders. Look, I just want to thank you, Cassie. I don't, I've been listening to you. I don't know if any more questions have come through. Um, we might try and um, put this up somewhere and, and sort of keep the conversation going somehow. Um, but Cassie, you've been a very calming voice to me this morning, so I want to appreciate that. Uh, I think that we need to uh, keep, keep reviewing this all the time as we go through the next few weeks. So buying the book, having a look at Brené's uh, work um, is an excellent start, which I'm definitely going to be doing. So yeah. we're going to say, oh, did you want to say Sorry, something? Sorry, I was thinking because um, obviously libraries are closed. So borrowing the book uh, is a little bit of a challenge for, for most of us at the minute. Um, and I, I, I can't talk to, to other cities or states, but I do know that the Brisbane City Council have the audio book available through their, um, through their app if you're registered with the library services here in Brisbane. So... Um, right obviously audible and, and all the normal places and Brené narrates it so I do know that people who have listened to it love it because she's got a voice that generally yes. most can enjoy um, but yes I, I, I know for sure that the Brisbane Library has it available to to download audio for, for no cost. And Leanne says her special on Netflix as well. 
Yeah, so she's got bunches of talks, um, but Netflix, she did about a 90-minute talk related to her work with Dare to Lead. And don't forget her TED Talk as well, uh, her very first TED TED Talk, not TEDx, it was a TED Talk, uh, had millions of views. That's the very first thing um, that you should be watching and, and listening to if you've not heard her work before. So just Google TED. All right, well, we know that you've got very busy days ahead and just really, again, want to appreciate you. It's been so lovely to have you online and to have this conversation with you all. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I really hope that you'll take this information and let it soak in and, uh, and share it with your team. And if there's any way, I'm going to actually, my last slide is uh, there are some other tools that I found that you can find on the internet around this stuff. So just go hunting. Um, we'll be having another tea and buns at the end of April. I haven't yet decided the topic. You just don't know yet. Um, but if you have any ideas about what you'd like us to talk about, um, send it through to me, please. Uh, we just love to know how to support you. Um, if there's any ideas around research or, or anything else, um, just contact me and let me know if, and I'll certainly, if we can, um, we're just we're just trying to see what the sector uh, needs right now. So I'll say goodbye. Thank you, Cassie, again. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. I've loved all of your chat and the links and everything. Uh, Lindy, tea and buns is always online. I've never done it in person. It's always online. Uh, so once you have the link, you can always join in. You don't need to register every month. Um, once you have that link, you can join us anytime. And I'll send you out a little email letting you know when the, when the next, um, I'm reminding you of this date and what the topic will be in April. Okay, so see you folks. Uh, stay safe, stay well, stay calm, and uh, lead bravely. I'll say that. <laughs> All right, see you folks.